uh, Eric, why don't you start making your way on up here? So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce to you Eric Hernandez. And you can read about him, I know, in the bulletin already, but I want to give you some information that is in between the lines, all right? You do not know probably that he was a cheer coach for 15 years. Emma, got bad news, darling. No children's sermon today. Unless you want Ella, yeah, not Emma, Ella, thank you, yes. Um, unless you want a 40-minute uh, or 45-minute children's sermon. But we do have We Worship right over there with Miss Barbara. So, kids, this is your time. Kids, uh, whether you're 3 or 83, y'all can go on over there, and so uh, we'll let you do that. But Ella, you can go on over there. Yep. All right, she's going. So, anyway, uh, Eric, yes, er Eric is coming up here. Eric was a cheer coach for 15 years, so I'm hoping he leads us in a cheer at some point, maybe. Maybe not, okay, I don't know, whatever you feel like. And he was also, doesn't he look like a, a Christian heavy band drummer? That's, that's because he was in a band called At Calvary. More importantly, he is married to uh, Kimball, Kendall and glad that uh, he has done so because they have Addison and Hudson as kids. I know you're proud of them, but you got something to share with us from the Word of God. So Eric, Amen. come on please. Thank you. Uh, I want to go ahead and jump in, and, and but first want to say thank you guys for being here, and of course thank you Pastor Dana uh, for doing this. As you know, we have a conference coming up, uh, the Unapologetic Evangelism Conference, so uh, it's heading it up by the association being hosted here at your wonderful church. Um, Pastor Dana and and our BSM director, Stephen, uh, I know he's somewhere in here, has also been helping us lead that. There he goes. I want to jump right in. So Richard Dawkins, has anyone ever heard of Richard Dawkins? I'm not sure, is this connecting? There we, anybody ever heard of Richard Dawkins? Wrote a book called The God Delusion, and he's a very influential atheist, he's a scientist, and in his book, which sold millions of copies all around the world, translated in over 30 different languages, here's a famous quote from his book. In it, he says the following. It may be the batteries. He says, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. He is jealous and proud of it. He is a Petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capricious, malevolent bully. What do you think? How does that make you feel? Because even if you don't understand a lot of the words he was using, I certainly didn't when I first read it, suffice it to say that he is saying a lot of nasty things about the God that you and I just worshipped. But here's my next question. How do you respond to this? Because we live in a culture that is being influenced by men like this. And again, quite a popular, very loud atheist and intellectual. At least he thinks he is. Um... And I guarantee you that whatever school uh, uh, affiliation, in some cases even churches that you attend, will be influenced by men like this in one way or another. Now, we won't have time to go into a refutation of this, but a, a good book I recommend is by Paul Cope and his God a Moral Monster, where he goes into a lot of these accusations that, that Dawkins gives. But I'm reminded of something that Christ said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Excuse me. And he says... You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its purpose, it is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and walked on by men. Now, because this was written at a time different than ours, and because there's such a wide technological gap between this passage and the time that we live in now, I find that we often tend to miss the illustrations and purposes of the analogies, that, especially that Christ uses. So, to understand the analogy... You have to first understand what salt was used for in ancient times. Because see, in biblical times, they didn't have refrigerators like we do now, so they couldn't store food in a fridge to prolong its shelf life. So instead, what they would do is they would take salt, and salt would act as a preservative to prolong the life of the meat and keep it from spoiling. Now, with that contextual understanding in mind, who is the salt of the earth? You, me, us, the church. And then if that's the case, then the meat would be indicative of what? Well, the meat would represent our culture, our society, our world. And I ask you this morning, is the meat going bad? Absolutely. But here's what Christ is saying. Suppose you live in these ancient times, and you go to the local market, and you buy this bag of salt. And you come home, and you begin to apply the salt to various pieces of meat that you own. 
But then after so many days, you begin to notice that no matter how much salt you add, no matter what type of meat you add it to, it continues to spoil and perish just as it normally would as if there were no salt to begin with. And what Christ is saying is that if this happens, then at some point you have to stop asking what's wrong with the meat. And at some point you step back and you have to ask yourself what's wrong with the salt. Because according to Jesus, when the meat spoils, he doesn't blame the meat. He points to the salt. You, me, we are the salt of the earth. A couple questions for you this morning. When people ask me, what is apologetics? I find the best way to explain it is by asking two questions. And I say, let me ask you two questions and let me respond as a skeptic. First question is, why are you a Christian? And the second question is, why should I, let's say I'm a skeptic, why should I be a Christian? And I've received many uh, responses to this. And I remember one in particular, I was, I was at this men's conference I was going to speak at years ago before I was with Texas Baptist. And the keynote speaker, who was a pastor, he, he approached me in a kind of, sort of a patronizing way. And he said, so you do apologetics. He says, well, you know, we don't really need that because you know what they say, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I have my personal testimony. And this is the answer I usually get for the first question. I have my personal testimony of how God changed and saved my life. Because see, I was addicted to drugs, I was in gangs, I was violent, I was an alcoholic, I was going through a divorce, but the one true God changed my life and no one can argue with my experience. So I don't need apologetics to defend my faith. I mean, I was was a little confused as to why another Christian would wanna argue with me prior to serving with me on stage, but I said, let me ask you a question as a hypothetical. I said, so, so tell me how you do evangelism. He says, well, once a month we, we go to these apartments near our church and we set up this station and we cook hot dogs and hamburgers and we interact with the community and we play basketball with the kids and then I share my testimony. I said, that's fantastic. But as a hypothetical, so you go for lunch. Let's suppose five or six hours later, a different religious group comes. So let's say they're Muslim. And they go to the same apartment complex and they set up a station right where you were at and they cook hot dogs and hamburgers and they play basketball with the kids and they interact with their community. But then their religious leader, who's a Muslim, he gets up and grabs a microphone and he shares his testimony. And let's suppose for the sake of argument that his testimony is like, I don't know, 10 times better than your testimony, right? Uh, He was in 10 different gangs, addicted to 10 different types of drugs, had 10 bottles of alcohol at his house, going through 10 different divorces, because in Islam you can have more than one wife, going through 10 different divorces, but then he grabs a mic and leans into it and says, but the one true God, Allah, changed my life. I said, now earlier you told me that a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. So based on his personal experience and testimony, would you then drop to your knees and devote your life to Allah and convert to Islam? And he said, no, of course not. I said, right. That's kind of my point. Now don't hear me saying what I'm not saying. I'm not saying there's necessarily no place for testimony. That's a whole other discussion. But I'll put it the way the Bible says it. The scripture says that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe, but power to those who do. So our job as believers is how do we take what the world deems as foolishness and translate that to demonstrate its power? Well, I submit to you that is in part the discipline and task of apologetics. When we look at scripture, 1 Peter 3.15 says, to be ready to give an answer, a defense to anyone who asks you for the hope that is in you. Because see, when, if you were to ask me, Eric, how would you answer those two questions? Why am I a Christian? Why should you be a Christian? My answer is simple. And I only have one answer for both questions. And it's really deep and profound, and you might want to write this down. Why am I a Christian? Why should you be a Christian? The answer, because it's true. What a new idea, right? Let me put it this way. Suppose you ask me, Eric, why do you believe water is H2O? And I said, oh, let me tell you why. Because ever since I began to believe that water's H2O, I've become a much better husband and father. And in fact, uh, uh, my life has been so much happier and I, I find so much more fulfillment. And then once a week I get together with a group of friends and we read these books about how water is H2O. And then we sing these beautiful songs about how water is H2O. And, and I just, I'm compelled and I, and I find myself in tears. And then recently, a few years ago, this secular rapper came out and said he believed water was H2O, so it has to be H2O. 
Now you laugh, but how similar is that to the responses we give when people ask why we're Christians? If you don't like me, I'm done after this. I don't blame you. But you are the salt of the earth. Is salvation predicated on our emotional experience or testimony? Does Christ need us for Christianity to be true? Because there's only one thing that makes Christianity true, and that's the fact that God exists and raised Jesus from the dead. And if that's the case, it's true and all bets are off. And anything that is not Christian by default must be false, given the laws of logic, because you can't have more than one answer. If one's true, the other's false. And hence, 1 Peter 3.15 says, to be ready to give an answer. And that word, or defense, and that word in the Greek is apologia, which is where we get the word apologetics, which again is translated is the English word for defense. And hence, apologetics is simply given a defense for what we believe. Which means if you are a New Testament believer today in this church, which I hope and assume everyone is, then you are commanded by Christ to give an answer, to be ready to give an answer, a defense to anyone who asks you for the hope that is in you, and to do so with gentleness and respect. If you're taking notes, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, and, and as a disclaimer, I'm gonna apologize ahead of time. I, I naturally speak fast because I have ADHD and I'm Hispanic, and when you put those together, <laughs> it's not a good combination. Um, thank you for, for laughing at my mental disorder. Uh, so, <clears throat> But at the end of this, I'll give you a link where you can download the slides that I presented today, and I have some material you can, you can take as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 4 through 5. It says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty before God for the overthrow, destruction, and pulling down of strongholds. Now, this passage is concerning spiritual warfare, and what it's telling us up front is that one of the primary purposes of spiritual warfare is to be able to tear down, destroy, demolish a stronghold. Now the next question becomes though, what is a stronghold? And growing up, I was told that strongholds were things like demon possession or alcoholism, addiction. It can encompass that, but it's actually defined in the very next verse. And we find in the next verse, in verse five, it actually defines strongholds as things like thoughts, ideas, and beliefs. It says, we refute, tear down, destroy arguments, reasonings, and every high and proud thing that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Which means, biblically speaking, a stronghold can be defined as things like our thoughts, ideas, reasonings, philosophies, arguments, and presuppositions that go against the knowledge of God. And quite literally, according to scripture, this is the spiritual warfare within our culture. There are these false ideologies that will hinder someone from coming to a salvific knowledge of God. And if you're a Christian today, you are commanded by God to be ready to give an answer and to destroy the stronghold that you encounter that is hindering someone from coming to the knowledge of God. Which means, biblically speaking, if you want to be effective in evangelism, if you want to be effective in spiritual warfare, if you want to be effective in discipleship, then you cannot do so without the dis discipline and task of apologetics, biblically speaking. And, and I cannot overemphasize this point because oftentimes, um, it, you'll notice we have a flyer and you were given one as well. We have a conference coming up and, and sometimes people tend to assume, oh, this will be nice for the youth. It will, but it's not a young thing for young people. It is a biblical man mandate to any and every New Testament believer. If you actually read it, there is no age recommendation or age cap for when, it, for when or how to do this. And so when it comes to spiritual warfare, we are commanded to tear these down. Why? Because a person cannot come to knowledge or deeper knowledge of God with such strongholds. Now, at this point, I hear sometimes people say, but Eric, isn't it all about faith? I don't have time to go into how this word has been misapplied and abused by both Christians and non-Christians, the word faith, but let's look at what Christ said. They approached Jesus and they say, out of all the commandments in the Old Testament, which one is the greatest? And how many commandments are in the Old Testament? Sometimes people shout 10, and I say, close enough. It's actually 613, but 10, that's, that's pretty close. But out of all 613 commandments in the Old Testament, he says this one's the greatest. He says, to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is a first and principal commandment. Now, if we were to briefly break this down, Essentially, here's what he's saying. That when we love God with our heart, the heart would have been indicative of our emotions. 
That is, you know, we, we worship God, we cry at the altar, we lift our hands. That is good. Continue to do that because that is in part loving God with the heart. And then he says to love God with your strength. And this would be indicative of our service towards God. You know, we, we pull out chairs for youth group. We bring the casseroles to the Baptist potlucks. We volunteer at church. And this is good, church. Continue to do so because this is in part loving God with your strength. But then there's loving God with the mind. In the Greek, it's, it's a word that entails your intellect and your faculty of understanding, your thought process and rationality. And if I can say with a heavy heart, the modern Western 21st century American church has really dropped the ball in this area. And it hasn't always been this way. If you were to go back in time with me to let's say 325 AD, you would find the Council of Nicaea. You would find the early church fathers gathered together to discuss and respond to heresies that were arising against the doctrine of the Trinity and the incarnation of Christ. And, and because at the time, Christianity was still a relatively new religion. And heresies began to arise. So they gathered together to make sure they were on the same page. Because see, around this time, their greatest concern as the church was this. Is what we believe logically consistent? Is what we believe philosophically coherent? Is what we believe rational? And is it biblical and is it true? And because of this, they began to hammer out these difficult philosophical questions. Like... How can we explain this doctrine to, to people who are rejecting it or don't understand it? Well, we can say that, we, that, 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 that there's a trinity, that there's one God but three persons. Or we can say that there's one what but three who's. Okay, but, but how do we encompass that all three of these are equally God and yet one? Well, we can say that they share in that divine substance. Ah, but what is the metaphysical understanding of a substance? How do we articulate that? And they begin to hammer this out. But what about Christ? Well, he had a divine nature, but he also had a human nature. So we could say that the divine nature took on a human nature and that he had a dual nature. Well, what is a nature? Well, he is a person with two natures, but one person, not two persons. Well, what is a person? How do we define and articulate the metaphysics of a person? Who here can answer these questions? Better yet, have these questions ever crossed your mind? This was their greatest concern. But mind you, it was also around this time that the church had seen some of the greatest persecution in history. Around this time, they're being fed to lions for entertainment. They're being boiled alive, beheaded, crucified upside down, running for their lives. And yet their greatest concern around the most gruesome time of persecution was, is what we believe true? And how can we articulate and present and defend this to a culture that doubts our God? Now fast forward with me. 2,000 years later to a 21st century Western American church and ask ourselves, what is our greatest concern? Are the church pews comfortable enough? Did they sing my favorite song during worship? Is there enough coffee in the lobby for visitors? Is there enough pizza for the pizza lock-in for the youth this weekend? Don't get me wrong, fair questions to ask, but what is truly our greatest concern? Because you are the salt of the earth. I went to speak years ago at a, at a church for their youth group, and before the service, the pastor wanted to have lunch with me. And as we're eating, he says, you know, I, I know you do apologetics and all, but I just don't think it has a place behind the pulpit. Maybe a Bible study, but certainly not a Sunday morning worship service. I'm not going to argue with the pastor whose church I'm about to preach at, but I said, well, you know, I, I agree to disagree. And thankfully, my sermon that night wasn't on apologetics, but as the service begins, the youth pastor invites me up and asks me to introduce myself briefly. I, I, I briefly mention apologetics, but I say, but if you have questions, see me after service. As I'm gathering my things at my chair after the service, I see this young man and his mom marching straight towards me. They stop right in front of me. 
And he looks at me and says, and then he points at me and says, tell her you said we could ask you questions, right? And I thought, I, I try to replay my sermon. Did I say something wrong? And I said, yeah, is everything okay? And then she looks at him and looked at me and said, well, as long as you're, you're okay with it, I'll let y'all talk. And then she walked off. And I looked at him. I said, what was that about? And then what he said next broke my heart. He said, I'm an atheist. I don't want to come to church, but my mom forces me to. So I come. But I've always had questions. And as I began to ask these questions to those in my youth group, and they couldn't answer them, they sent me to the youth pastor. And then he sent me to the pastor. Then he said, it's gotten to the point to where they sat me down and said, if you're going to come to church, sit down, shut up, and stop bothering people with your questions. But then he looked at me and said, but you don't come here. So the rule doesn't apply to you. And you said we could ask you questions. So do you mind if I ask you some questions? We talked for at least an hour. Brilliant kid. Good questions. And I said, who have you been reading? He's only a junior in high school. Sure enough, he had been reading guys like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens. And as I'm leaving, because I was getting late, I said, look, I'm, uh, I'm going to have breakfast with the pastor tomorrow. If, if, if you'd like, we can continue the conversation, and I'll give him my information, and we can talk later more over the phone or email. He said, that would be so great. I'm having breakfast with the pastor tomorrow, and I said, hey, pastor, I, I know what you said about apologetics, but you know you have an atheist in your youth group, right? And nervously, he laughed and said, yeah, that's so-and-so. We're praying for him. I said, you know what's going to take more than that? If you lose this kid, it's a small town in Texas, one high school. If you lose this kid, he's going to take at least half of that youth group with him. Out of respect for you and your church, I didn't want to give him my card, but I said, here's my business card, here's my personal cell and my email. Would you give this to him? Because I said we could continue the conversation. That was over eight years ago. Never heard from the kid. I doubt he ever got it. But you are the salt of the earth. There are three dominant strongholds in our culture. At the conference, I'm going to go much deeper into these. I I just want to touch on them briefly here. Because time is going so fast. And there are three dominant strongholds. I'm going to briefly present them, and again, I'm going to talk fast, I'll give you the notes later, Um, and then at the conference, we're going to go much deeper than this, but the first one is known as relativism or postmodernism. It is a view that truth is relative, there is no right or wrong, there is no absolute truth. So suppose if I'm standing here with the podium in front of me, I could say there's a dog to the right of the podium, but someone in the front row can say, no, there's a dog to the left of the podium. Who's right and who's wrong? Well, we're both right, and it just depends on their perspective. In the same way, says the postmodernist, there is no truth. There's no absolute truth. It's all relative. So, if you don't agree with same-sex marriage, that's fine. But don't tell someone else that they can't choose who they want to love. And if you're against abortion, that's fine too. But don't tell this young girl who got raped that she can't do what's best for her life because that's your truth, not mine. Stronghold. The next one is known as scientism. Note the ism. It is the view that science is the only way to gain knowledge about reality. And a person may say, if it cannot be scientifically proven, then it either cannot be known or cannot be true. You want me to believe in God? Show me the scientific evidence. Stronghold. The last one is known as naturalism. It is a view that the physical world is all that exists, nothing more, nothing less. And this one hits home for me. Freshman year of college, I took my first philosophy class because I thought it was a class I could just make something up and get an A and skip if I needed to. And then I really enjoyed it, found out my professor was an atheist. Next semester, I took another class intentionally knowing my professor was an atheist because I heard how condescending he was towards Christianity. In fact, my friend said, if you're going to take another class, don't take Pena's class because if you do, you might lose your faith. And I said, where can I sign up? 
but only not because I wanted to argue or debate with him, but because I knew that if Christianity was true, then I'm commanded to know why. But if it's false, I'd still like to know why, and maybe this guy was the man for the job. So here was the pivotal moment in my life and ministry. He walks into class one day, and he pretends to hold up this antidepressant pill. And he pulls it out from, uh, to show everybody in the light, and he says, now, religion wants us to believe in something like a soul. And because of this immaterial soul, we can have hope in an afterlife to see our family and friends that have gone before us. But here's a problem. According to Christianity, your soul, which is supposed to be immaterial, also contains your thoughts, emotions, and, and, and moods and sensations, which are also not physical. But the problem is, if I took this antidepressant pill, which is physical, it has the power to change and affect the alleged immaterial states of my soul. But how could that be? How can something tiny and physical affect the immaterial? Because every time we look at brain scans, all we see are neurons firing. And every time we look at the body under a microscope, all we see are the base elements of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. But no scientist has ever looked under a microscope and found something like a soul. How can that be? And he said, the answer is simple. I'll tell you how. Here's the answer. He said, the answer is that there is no soul. There is no heaven. There is no hell. There is no God. There is no afterlife. You are just a physical brain and body, a meat machine, and we need to learn to live with this fact, get on with our lives, and stop believing in these foolish fairy tales. Class dismissed. Stronghold. Now, I was a freshman in college. Not only had I never heard anyone give an argument against the soul, I thought everyone believed it, but it dawned on me that if what he said was true, Christianity would be false, and here's why. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then our faith is in vain, and essentially Christianity cannot be true if Christ did not rise. Well, by the same line of logic, if there is no soul, there can be no resurrection, and once again, if no resurrection, Christianity cannot be true. Stronghold. How would you respond to something like that? Well, we're out of time. If you want the answer, you can get my DVD back there, A Case for the Soul, uh, for $20. Um, I'm joking, but uh, you can get it back there. Uh, briefly, I, I do want to mention this. At our conference, I'll go much deeper into these, and with the time we have left, I'm going to rush through some responses. Uh, but it's an entire hour in the case for the soul. Um, that, that, the, the subject of the soul has now become the era that I've specialized in because of him. In fact, I drive a Kia Soul just because it makes for a good joke when I teach on the subject. Um, but we have that DVD back there. What we're talking about right now is spiritual warfare of our culture. I'm going to briefly touch on evidence for God. These are also DVDs, $15. We also have some download cards. Um, if you want to go really in-depth, we have a whole course put together. This is the most expensive thing. It's $50, 10 hours, 200 pages of notes. And if you, people have asked me, what about a whole package like for everything on the table because I've got debates back there on abortion with an atheist and whatnot. Um, if you want to make a donation of $100, you can take everything. And my very first public debate on God's existence was actually with my former professor I just mentioned. Anybody see the movie God's Not Dead? Yeah, I can't stand that movie. It's a horrible movie. But it's a similar concept to where I had an atheist in college and he was actually my first public debate five years later. What was interesting about that is that the church that was hosting it wasn't my church. They didn't expect a lot of people to show up. And including an online audience, there were about five to 600 people watching the debate that night. And there were more atheists than Christians at church because of how influential this guy was. If you buy the whole package, I'll give you the download card for free. If you don't like hard copies, we have downloads. But most importantly, here's what I want you to do first is go sign up for this. If you sign up for this, I'll give you one of my debates for free, a download card, September 17th, we're going to be talking about the problem of evil, Can You Trust Scripture, um, Sexuality and, and Gender by Amy Davison of Mama Bear Apologetics, fantastic speaker and author. I'll be going more into strongholds. Strobel will be talking about evangelism with Mark Middleberg, and we're going to be the salt of the earth that day. I would love to see you there. Let me also say this. Invite someone. Invite nonbelievers. We're going to have an open Q&A at the end of it. Invite your friends and family. Let's be the salt of the earth together. Let's run through these briefly. So let's go to the first stronghold. So there is no truth. I have, I have had people tell me this. Eric, there is no truth. 
Christianity cannot be true because there is no truth. And I said, okay. Well, I just have one question. I said, um, is that true? Because if there is no truth, and you're saying that as if it is true, then by your own standard, what you just said can't be true. It's what we call in philosophy self-defeating. Because to say there is no truth is to assume that there is at least one truth, namely there is no truth, but there is no truth. The statement there is no truth cannot be true. So it's self-defeating. Now, it is funny when you hear the answer, but without raising your hand, who here could have provided an answer to this stronghold before my response? You are the salt of the earth. I'm gonna skip through some of these slides. Like I said, I'm, we're gonna go much deeper. Um, it's funny stuff too. We're gonna go much deeper uh, on the 17th. What about scientism? The view that uh, the f science is the only way to gain knowledge about reality. Uh, suffice it to say that that's false. How do we know that? For various reasons. Here's one problem with it. I'll just share one with you. It's also self-defeating, won't go into that, but here's a problem. I have atheists sometimes say, Eric, give me the scientific evidence for God. And my response is usually, and why would I want to do a silly thing like that? And because there's often a confused look on their face, I say, let me explain it this way. God, if he exists, is by definition a non-physical entity. And science, it's a wonderful discipline, it's a wonderful tool, but it is a tool that is by definition limited to only studying the physical world. So if God is, exists and is by definition non-physical, you cannot use a discipline like science, which is limited to only studying the physical, to try and inve investigate something non-physical. It, it, it's called in philosophy a category fallacy. Imagine this. Suppose you went to the beach with a friend, and y'all separated for an hour. An hour later, he comes back with a metal detector. And he says, you know what? I just made a remarkable discovery. I just discovered there is no plastic on this beach. In fact, I don't even think plastic exists. Confused, you look over his shoulder and you see the beach is littered with plastic. And you, you say, why would you assume, why would you say that? And he says, I'll tell you why. Because you see this metal detector right here. I spent an hour or more combing this beach with this metal detector and it found a lot of metal, but not once did it ever detect, detect plastic. And you say, well, of course it didn't because it's a metal detector, not a plastic detector. In the same way, if God exists and is not physical, you cannot use a physical discipline that is limited to the physical to try and investigate something non-physical. It is a category fallacy. There are other ways in which we can do this, logic, philosophy, reasoning, but science is not the tool for the assessment. So by definition, this stronghold cannot even apply to the very thing it objects to. Um, naturalism. Without going... Before touching on the soul, uh, uh, here's where I want to touch a little bit on evidence for God, which I want to present to you an argument by Dr. Willem Lane Craig. Does anyone know who this guy is? Willem Lane Craig. Um, if you don't, it's no big deal. He's probably just, you know, one of the greatest living Christian philosophers and apologists today. Other than that, not much of a big deal. Um, has an argument known as the Kalam Cosmological Argument. Don't worry about the big name. But it's three sentences, two sentences. In philosophy, it's a syllogism, two premises and a conclusion. Easy to memorize. You can share this with someone in 30 seconds or less. And I've done this before. I was, I was once at a, um, I've done this many times, but one time in particular, I was getting my oil changed. And as I'm waiting, I have my headphones in while I'm looking at my emails. And everyone knows that when a millennial has their headphones in, it's a universal sign to, you know, don't bother me, right? So this lady is pacing back and forth in front of me. And then she stops, and I take out my headphones. I'm like, are you okay? She goes, hey, do you believe in God? And I, I go, yeah, not only do I believe God exists, I know he exists. And she goes, but how do you know? I said, hand me that napkin. I'll show you. This is what I presented to her. 30 seconds or less. I'm going to take a little longer than that, but if you're in a taxi cab, an elevator, or if you follow someone to the bathroom and they sit down, you've got at least 30 seconds, and you can get your witness in. Premise one. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Conclusion, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, based on this, we can put it this way. T to understand the argument, you have to understand that three things came into existence at the inception of the universe. And these three things were time, space, and matter. In other words, to put it in the inverse, if there were no universe, there would be no time, no space, no space 
No matter. I'm going to rebuke this remote in Jesus' name. No, we might need some batteries. No time, no space, no matter. So we can break it down this way. If everything that begins to exist has a cause and the universe began to exist, we can actually unpack attributes of this cause by looking at the thing it caused. Let me put it this way. In philosophy, causes are always greater than prior to and uh, external to their effects. So for example, the, the guy who made this remote that, that, that keeps stopping on me, the, the guy who made this is not inside of it making it run because as the cause of the existence of the remote, he is external and prior to it. So by that line of logic, if time, space, and matter had a beginning, and if everything that begins needs a cause, then based on a logical deduction, if the universe began, then there must necessarily exist a cause that is timeless, spaceless, and immaterial. Does that sound familiar to you? So we can say it this way. If the universe began to exist, then there must exist a cause that was timeless, spaceless, and immaterial. Now, at this point, I've had atheists stop me and say, but wait a minute, you're trying to talk about God. And I say, really, you think so? And, and, and they say, but, but why, why posit God as a cause? Why couldn't it be something natural that caused the universe? And I said, well, because nature had a beginning, and if everything that begins needs a cause, well, then to say something natural caused all of nature would be to imply that nature existed logically prior to its existence in order to bring itself into existence, which is a logical contradiction. So if nature had a beginning, it too would need a cause, and this cause must be transcendent to nature, something beyond nature, something non-natural, beyond the natural, something that like, um, actually there's a word for that, supernatural, literally beyond the natural, uh, a being that is unimaginably powerful. Why? Because creation ex nihilo out of nothing. And then you would need a being that is personal. Why? In short, because... The universe did not have to exist, so its existence was caused from a decision. Decisions come from minds, which are grounded in wills, which come from persons. So we could say, you take a deep breath for dramatic effect, if the universe began to exist, then there must exist a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, supernatural, unimaginably powerful, personal being, and I just call him God for short. And I have the privilege of calling him my Heavenly Father. And I pray that you do as well. The soul, briefly. If what my professor was saying is true, then he's going to have to say that the mind is nothing more than the brain. Can I briefly show you how not only have these strongholds infiltrated our culture, they've snuck into our churches and we haven't noticed it. I'll just do it for this one. And I'll be closing soon. Audience participation. Can you please point to me to what part of your body thinks? Can you do that for me? Point to what part of your body thinks. Okay. I see this. Brain. Does your brain think? Okay, I see heads nodding yes. Do you need a brain to think? Yes? Okay. Next question. Does God have a brain? I didn't hear anything that time. I'm sorry. Is this a Mormon church? Baptist church, right? No, God does not have a brain. Why? Because he's not physical. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Mormons believe God is physical. We don't believe he's physical. No, he doesn't have a brain. Huh. Does God think? Yeah. Psalm says his thoughts towards us are more than the grains of sand. God thinks. Hmm. But wait a minute. You said your brain thinks. You need a brain to think. God doesn't have are you made in his image? Huh. Hey, do you need a brain to think? And if you say yes, I'm going to have to do it all over again. <clears throat> Why is this a conundrum? Let me come clean. It was a trick question. There is no part of your body that thinks. You are an immaterial soul that has a body. You, you are a soul that has a body. You don't have a soul. You have a body. And a, soul, a body without a soul is a corpse. You are a soul, your mind is within your soul, it is immaterial. So your brain does not think. Now, yes, there are a correlated group of neurons firing. When we have thoughts, there is brain activity neurologically, but it doesn't mean they're the same thing. But why is this a conundrum for us? In brief, because we live in a culture that appeals to naturalism. 
and without having the eyes to see it, with, while failing to be the salt to the earth, I mean the church in general, not this church or that, well, maybe the church down the road, but in general, the, the church is, we, we have failed to see these strongholds and recognize them, and the culture says, look, when you think there's brain activity, so let's just say your brain thinks, we think, oh, let's be neutral. Sure, let's say the brain thinks. That's not neutrality, that's naturalism. Yet, we believe the brain thinks in a secular culture, then we come Sunday morning to a church, lift our hands, and worship a God who has no brain and thinks just fine, and we never let these two beliefs come together because we sometimes just don't take our theology that seriously. But you, me, we are the salt of the earth. Now, how do we know the mind's not physical? If the mind and brain are the same thing, which is what my professor was saying, then based on what's known as a law of identity, whatever is true of the mind is true of the brain and vice versa. But by this law of identity, if I can show you just one thing true of one that's not true of the other, they can't be the same thing. I'll give you three briefly. My thoughts can be true or false. This is a property of my mind. My brain is not true or false. Can't be the same thing. My Thought, my brain can weigh three pounds, but the thought that I'm talking to you right now does not weigh three pounds. You may be having heavy thoughts right now, but we're not going to buy a neck brace after we're done here, right? Um, thank you, a few people. Um, my brain can be seven inches long, but the smell of a rose or the taste of a banana, which is in my mind, is not seven inches long. And I can go through many more examples, but the point is simple. If all the properties of the mind are not physical and all the properties of the brain are physical, then it follows that if consciousness exists, it cannot be reducible to something physical because you are a soul, not purely a brain and body. And if there's non-physical things that exist, I would then further argue that atheism can't be true. So I ask the atheist, if you're conscious, can you still be an atheist? We'll go much more into that later, but I leave you with this. You're the salt of the earth. But if it loses its purpose, it is no longer good but to be thrown at and walked on. Is a church being walked on today? We're the salt of the earth.